Graham. I'm Miriam Knight, the publisher of New Consciousness Review, a digital multimedia magazine and website where we review the top books and films having an impact on the global awakening. Our website is ncreview.com. Now, on this show, we explore the many and varied faces of conscious awakening, what that can mean in your life, and generally celebrate consciousness in action. My guest today is Dr. James Rouse. He's a naturopathic physician, entrepreneur, certified yoga instructor, speaker, author, radio talk show host, QVC Network Wellness Doctor since 2007, contributor to GuyM.com, and Ironman Triathlete. James, I'm tired just reading that. Oh, my gosh. Well, we should take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. James is best known for his highly engaging Optimum Wellness TV segments that highlight all areas of wellness, lifestyle, balancing mind, body, and spirit. He is the author, along with his wife, Dr. Deborah Rouse, of Eat, Think, no, Think, Eat, Move, Thrive, The Practice for an Awesome Life, which we are going to discuss today. Welcome, James. Uh, well, Miriam, I want you to know what an honor and pleasure it is to be with you and to be with your community. Thank you for the blessing. Now, we all know that we should be eating a healthy diet and exercising, and there are a gazillion diet books out there, and I know personally because I've tried most of them. But your book goes a long way beyond that to address the whole person. It's really about creating a total lifestyle and mindset shift. How did you come to put these four elements of eat, of think, eat, move, and thrive together? Miriam, it was really, it's been ethnography for me, and truly, on one level, certainly just witnessing my own life, growing up in a family that was not, how should we say, highly integrated when it came to self-care, a, a family that suffered from uh, various addictions, from alcohol to um, controlled substances, and so I got a chance to witness that, which was challenging, and I guess looking back, did have its blessing. So for me, the, the work began when I was a child, witnessing what wasn't working, witnessing sadness, or w witnessing the grief that went along with that, and then certainly uh, the blessing of working with nearly 10,000 patients over the last 20 years in a clinical setting, which really taught me a few things, Miriam. Number one, that people really don't enjoy going on diets, number one. And every good study that's ever been done on people who are looking at making a change, whether it be exercise, whether it be working on their own optimism, a mind shift, or even just, if you will, trying to integrate more clean eating into their life, we typically are not motivated to do so, or at least sustain our motivation, when it's about getting healthy, if it's about fighting heart disease, if it's about working on diabetes. These things are all important and obviously can be wonderfully and, and superbly supported through a healthy lifestyle. But really what it was for me when I wanted to put together this book with my wife, Deborah, it was really about the idea that we are truly motivated when it's about doing something that's going to help us to become a better version of ourselves. In fact, University of Michigan has done a lot of great research, Miriam, where they've looked at what it is that really keeps people engaged in their self-care, what helps people to stay you know, fully embracing of the idea of self-love throughout the day, whether it's with exercise and eating well, and hands down, what really motivates people more than anything is the idea of just feeling good. And so this is a book about how do we feel good that has tons of good science, that has wonderful clinical relationships, but ultimately it's a book about how do we can reclaim that idea of self-love and self-care so we can thrive again in our lives. And yes, there's some good eating principles and there's some wonderful stuff on exercise, but truly, it all begins with your thinking, and I'm a big fan of how it is the power of our thought truly is the catalyst for changing every area of our life. Well, you start by asking people to think, which, you know, might be a kind of uh, revolutionary concept. Um, I like the idea that you suggest of creating a vision of what you want your life to be and creating a mission statement for yourself. Why is that so important? Well, you know, Miriam, it, it's, it's interesting, and I, and I believe that a lot of us, and um, I'm not sure how it is with you in your world, but as a father of two teenage daughters, as someone who's doing what I can each and every day to learn, to evolve, and to see how I can serve at a higher level each and every day, and also overcome challenges and failures along the path, 
which is just part of wearing the Earth suit. It's just how things go. I, I find that what's interesting is that when we can really use the brain and how it's intended to be used, and I don't want to say it's too utilitarian, but when you get right down to it, having a vision, having a vision statement, having an idea about what it is that you want to be achieving in your life and being very, very focused, it really enlists a part of our brain, something called the anterior cingulate, which is she's like the CEO, and she is the part of our brain that's the visionary. She's the one who commands. She's the one who gets things done. And this is really important because I think for many, many years, we thought, we thought of vision boards or vision statements or mantras as just kind of a maybe even a spiritual platitude. But what we do know is that research supports the idea that when we have a mind eye, if you will, of what is it we want to have in our life, Miriam, it really gets the parts of our brain involved that help us to carry out the detail. It helps us to be successful. Well, that uh, sounds convincing. Um, how do you actually, um, well, in, in fact, since I read your book. Yes, I see that you have uh, some really interesting kind of action steps. And one of the things I liked about your book is that at every point where the reader is going to say, but, 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 you go through all of the objections that we could possibly have and address them individually. Um, how did you, was that just life experience, or did you have some other source of information? <laughs> you know, Miriam, it, it, was, it was a combination of many things, but ultimately, yes, it, it was all about life experience. And I think if you were to ask yourself or ask a loved one, ask a friend, ask many people who have been a part of your community here on, on your show, you know, we, we have all kinds of for reasons, if you will, how we've talked ourselves out of our greatness. And, I'm, yes, having worked with many, many patients over many years, but also my own life of, of setting challenges and when I wasn't successful and all the reasons I could create for why I wasn't successful, you know, I've really done my best to pay attention from all levels of my life. And that was the, that was the goal of this book. I want this to be a real manual versus a sermon. I don't think people need to be told what to do. And I, I bet, Miriam, if we asked nine out of ten of your listeners and nine out of ten of the people who were part of your community, if they generally knew what it is that they should be eating or should be doing in terms of a healthy lifestyle, no question. I believe 90 plus percent could give you a pretty good idea of what they should be doing. And then they'd have a real strong reason if they weren't following through why they're not. And I think what's really interesting about that is that we wanted to write the book in terms of so we could see ourselves and, oh, that's the but I use. That's the objection that I have. That's the limiting belief that I use against myself from really going for what I know in my life would really benefit me. So the book was really designed to help us overcome that, that old thinking, if you will, the stinking thinking, <laughs> I love to call it, or, if you will, just something that we could see in other people's experiences go, wow, you know what? That is something I could use to keep myself holding back, or now I can see I can overcome that. So the, the, the things we've been hearing lots from our readers is that it really gave them a manual and a guide, but also, if you will, it was written to be like a trusted friend, not so clinical that you felt like it was someone telling you what to do, but really more offering an opportunity of what we could be doing if we so desired and giving us a hand-holding, if you will, to help us guide the process. Well, I wonder how much of it is a hand-holding and how much of it is an arm twisting. <laughs> well, you know what? I guess it depends on where we are in our lives. And, yes, I, I, I feel very strongly, and I, and I have to be very uh, honest with you, Miriam. I'm, I'm a zealot for this. I, I believe strongly in that we, as a, as a nation, we, we, we have a lot of work to do. And I believe there's been a lot of unique ways that we've talked ourselves out of our vitality. We, we, we've held ourselves back from the possibility of how good we could be leading our lives and the kind of experience we could be having physiologically and spiritually and emotionally. So there is some arm twisting here if one wants to see it that way. But I, I try to do it with love. Uh, I <laughs> certainly try to do it with compassion. And I always try to do it from a place of, hey, you know what? I've been there. I understand. My life, like yours, is, is, has its challenges, has its ups and downs. But ultimately, if it's an arm twisting, it's only because I'm doing my own arm twisting for myself 
to really, if you will, use the permission system, which is seeing the mental equivalent of how we'd love our life to be and then giving ourselves permission to overcome what it is that we believe is holding us back. I guess it's also really being honest with oneself and, and asking yourself what you want for your life. Do you, you know, is this all there is or do you want more? And that's where you uh, come back to that uh, vision and, and mission statement. Yeah, and I, gosh, I think that's so well said. And, you know, honesty is interesting, isn't it, Miriam? I, I, I would imagine that in your experiences with the different people you've talked with and the different work that you've done in your life, it, it is always interesting to give ourselves a, a moment to really stop and say, you know what, no censoring, you know, absolutely transparency. Let's be authentic. Let's be fully honest and assess where I am right now in my life. A am I happy? Am, am I peaceful? Am I, is my quality of my sleep restorative? Or am I, is my head busy at night because I have anxiety? Whatever the case may be, I, I think this is a good time. I think this is a very good time in, in our lives, all of us to collectively say, you know what, I'm open to a higher quality of living. I I'm open to being very honest where my challenges are. I'm open to really, if you will, having a sense of compassion towards myself so I can really open up to what the possibilities may be if I'm willing to stand with myself versus judge myself. And, yes, honesty and, and maybe some tough love there, but ultimately I believe compassion and acceptance are the greatest beginning points to make any kind of change in your life. Well, now, in, in this rather interesting time that we're living in, I would say anxiety and stress rank high on the list of emotions that we're all experiencing on a daily basis. Now, you have several ways of addressing this. One recommendation was a news fast, um, and then you had dietary recommendations, meditation, um, and Tell me about the 5 a.m. thing. <laughs> ah, the 5 a.m. thing. I, I have to admit, Miriam, and I'm going to be fully, fully out there with you, I am a huge, huge proponent of early rising. I've, I've worked with Fortune 50 and Fortune 500 companies and CEOs from literally all over the world over the last 20 years, and I've spent a lot of time really studying the habits of the most successful people. I've also spent a lot of time studying the habits of the most happy and seem to be fulfilled people. And there's many things I see in terms of their traits and some of their characteristics. One thing that absolutely goes across the board with happiness, success, and fulfillment, all of these people, and I literally have spent time with over a thousand of these people interviewing and just spending quality time, every single one of them, Miriam, is a morning person. These are people who get up early in the morning and take care of themselves. They take care of their mind. They take care of their spirit. They take care of their body. I, I see a common denominator here that I think so many people could learn from who wonder, you know, whether or not waking up in the morning and the first thing they do is check their email or check their phone and then go and listen to the news or watch the news and have some coffee. And I'm not making a judgment. It's just an observation. First thing in the morning, whether it be four, five, six, seven, those hours, your body's producing the highest level of cortisol. And cortisol, you probably know, is a stress hormone. And it's, it, it's, it's there for many good reasons, but typically, how should we say, we don't see it in its good reasons because when we have to, like, maybe run away from something, it's life-threatening, or we have to make a significant shift physically to get someplace, in, a, in, a, in an instant, cortisol is a great energy source. However, most people in this country don't use it that way. We typically see it more in the sense of it's about long-term stress. It's about chronic long-term stress. So first thing in the morning when cortisol levels are naturally their highest, it's a really good idea to use your morning to exercise, to use your morning to meditate, to use your morning to really, if you will, channel Give your cortisol a chance to go do something rather than marinate in your cortisol. And whether it's in relationship to anxiety or depression, what's really interesting is that the higher levels of your cortisol, the more opportunity we have to experience anxiety, the more opportunity we have to experience depression. Unless it is that we are doing something 
with our cortisol first thing in the morning. And yes, early risers typically who are up and being productive in their morning with their self-care, taking care of their mind and their body, they typically are doing much better therapeutically in how to actually manage their cortisol. And in that, they tend to have greater levels of happiness and productivity and higher levels of health and well-being. So I am a big fan of the morning. I I get every morning about 4.40, 4.30. I'm never in bed after 4.45, and it's been that way since I was a teenager. And now I'm in my mid-50s, and it's, yeah, it's the way I'm wired. But, my goodness, I've learned a lot. And the things I'm learning more and more is that you have a window every single morning where exercise and mindfulness and meditation and, and self-care if we can do that for an hour or two every single morning before we go out there and serve the world, I tell you, Miriam, it's a game changer for your health and your well-being. You mentioned quite a few game changers in your book. Um, so uh, let's go on to diet, I guess. Um, you talk about the standard American diet, and it's a very appropriate acronym, SAD. I think there's broad agreement as to what we need to avoid, like sugars, trans fats, processed foods, pesticides, preservatives, antibiotic-laden meat, artificial sweeteners, etc. There's a lot less agreement as to what one should eat. So how do you actually navigate that particular minefield? <laughs> you know, I try not to navigate it as a, like a law. I think what we have to do is really honor something I love to refer to as our own biochemical individuality, which is basically just a fancy way of saying that everyone has their affinity. And, you know, and within generalizations, I like to say that truly a plant-based approach is most ideal for most everybody. Now, does that mean you have to be vegan or vegetarian? No, not necessarily. But we should be gathering and really consuming the bulk of our calories, the bulk of our nutrition from plants. And I'm, I'm a huge proponent, and, I, and I'm zealously so about vegetables. I really believe we're, we undernourish ourselves when it comes to vegetables. So I think everyone has to look at the idea that, you know, when you look at the people who live the longest in the world, the ones who typically have the lowest levels of inflammation, the lower lowest levels of cancer rates and heart disease and other issues around chronic disease, we're going to see absolutely directly a relationship to diet. And by and large, the more vegetables that we consume, the lower the incidence of those kinds of diseases. Now, does that mean you can't have uh, animal-based proteins? No, but I think you have to be very clear that we don't need to have um, our, the fulcrum of our plate, the, the majority of our meals made up of animal-based proteins. They should be more of a side, if you will, or a, a condiment size versus the foundation. I'm really very, very strongly in favor of how do we actually build our plates with plants, have a plant slant, if you will, and then if you want to use animal-based proteins, use those as a side versus the, the foundation. And when you do that, your body has a real fighting chance to overcome inflammation, to truly stay metabolically awake, and really support long-term, I say, vitality on every level, both mind and body. You, you put me in mind of Dr. Terry Walls, who I interviewed a while back. She is a physician who had uh, such severe MS that she was in a recumbent wheelchair. And she used the time to do research on the Internet. Yes, even doctors do research on the Internet. <laughs> and actually put herself on a plant-based diet and cured herself of MS. In fact, she did a 15-mile bike ride through the mountains. So let's get back to the sad diet and making it happier. <laughs> we were talking before the break about um, the plant-based diet and, and what that did for our mutual acquaintance, Dr. Terry Walls. And, of course, there are many other proponents of a plant-based diet, but there are so many different competing theories, the paleo and the, the vegan and the vegetarian and the octo-pisky, whatever, <laughs> uh, ovo-piscatarian. Um, what do you find works best for you, and would something that works best for you perhaps be less appropriate for someone else? Gosh, that's a really interesting question, Miriam, and I don't know if there's a, an absolute here. 
I, I can just tell you that what I've seen from the majority of my patients and, and my own experience, I, I, I've tried a lot of different approaches. I grew up in a, in a very sad diet experience, uh, lots of refined carbohydrates, lots of sugar, um, you know, nothing, if you will, that was live. I grew up in the uh, 60s and 70s when Tang was the morning drink and Cheerios. Um, actually, not even Cheerios, my goodness, it was more like Fruit Loops and Captain Crunch and a lot of those types of glow-in-the-dark type cereals, I love to call them. <laughs> and, you know, you grow up on those and you, you realize, wow, that's interesting. And then I had the blessing, and I say this with the absolute conviction, the blessing of being home one day, um, sick, you know, not, uh, wasn't good to be sick, but the blessing was that I was watching television, and I was a little boy, and Miriam, I was awestruck by Jack LaLanne. Jack LaLanne came on TV and completely rocked my world. He, he, it's almost like he came right out of the TV, out of the box itself, and he, he grabbed my heart, and he said, you know what? You have the opportunity to shift everything in your environment by how you take care of yourself. And he used to say that exercise is queen and nutrition is king, and together you have a kingdom. And I was 12 years old, and that day I decided I was going to change my lifestyle at age 12. Uh, I gave up sugar. I started exercising. And, again, I grew up in a home where alcoholism and depression and a lot of other challenges were going on. So this was not easy. I mean, there was nothing around me that represented this type of a, a lifestyle, and there's no one to follow. But I decided to follow Jack Lane's lead. And from that experience, I've, I've been a vegan for 13 years. I was a vegetarian for nearly 10. Uh, I've done paleo. And I say a different kind of paleo. I don't I'm not all about mainlining, you know, um, meat and, and other kinds of forms of land-based proteins. I, I use them judiciously. I, I love wild fish on occasion. But where I've landed today, probably 75% of my diet is vegetables. The other 25% is a combination of nuts and seeds and lean proteins coming from wild fish, coming from wild game, and coming from other sources, always organic. I don't do any dairy. Uh, and I do, um, on occasion, I'll do a grain, but it's only quinoa. I don't do any kind of other grains or any kind of flours. I do occasionally quinoa, which I actually love. I think quinoa gets misrepresented as actually a seed, not a grain, but um, that, that's, a, that's a different story. So, But really, I've landed in a place where I've kind of experimented with almost everything in the last 40 years, and this is where I am today. I'm doing extremely well this way. I'm actually celiac, so... I don't have to worry about doing gluten because it doesn't work for me. I don't even have to experiment with, with flowers. So I don't know, Miriam. How, how about you? What, you know, where are you today? What's, what's working for you? What have you learned about your own life? Because I'm curious. I'm, I'm sure your listeners would love to know. What, all, with all the people you've interviewed, what do you believe is best? Well, the uh, litany that I cited at the beginning, obviously, you take out of your diet. That is a no-brainer. Um, and then I guess I'm pretty much along the lines of what you describe. I do eat um, organic grass-fed meat. Um, I, I was amused to read in your book when you overdosed on fish. You actually <laughs> got mercury yeah. poisoning. Yes. Oh my gosh! I thought I was. I thought I was going down. It was so scary. But uh, yeah, sometimes you think, wow. Wild salmon, get those omega threes, the DHA is so good for you. You might as well have six servings a day. Well, that was uh, not a good plan. <laughs> I, I think that just points out the wisdom of everything in moderation. Absolutely. But the other thing that uh, I was struck by, or you know, uh, is is that in the alternative world that we inhabit. We are big on supplements, and, you know, I think that we are brainwashed by the drug industry mindset that there is a pill for everything. And too many of us in the alternative-minded world simply substitute supplements for drugs where we could be getting the, the whole food nutrition out of functional foods. So that's that's one epiphany that I've come to, and and there are just a few supplements that I think 
that we are very difficult to get from food. So, uh, you know, things like um, uh, fish oil, uh, magnesium. I, I think uh, you, you mentioned a number of them. Uh, you, you and I are complete agreement. Um, I'm a huge fan of supplementing magnesium. I think magnesium is just one of those things that even with the most devout plant-based um, high nutrient density foods, we still sometimes fall short with magnesium. I think so with vitamin uh, D3 is another one, the fish oils, as you mentioned. And, and then maybe a few things here and there that can be helpful uh, on occasion. But that's pretty much the area, I believe, from a supplementation standpoint that we can, uh, how should we say, build around. But to your point, we, um, we use supplements sometimes all too often, I should say, much more than we should not very judiciously. We really kind of ask them to do the work of a, a healthy diet when we're not eating so healthy. And you and I both know, Miriam, it never works that way. And our body has a, a lot of wisdom, infinite wisdom, and it knows good food. It knows high nutrition versus synthetic supplementation. And it can get you through a pinch every now and then, but it should not be a way of life. I, I could not agree with you more. And we ignore the cofactors that uh, a, a full uh, plant-based diet or, you know, food-based diet, whole food-based diet provide so that we, uh, you know, instead of refining it down to the particular vitamin, we, we shortchange ourselves. Anyway, you, you talk about a healthy brain um, regime. What are the foods that support a healthy brain? I'm a huge fan of this particular area. It's an area I've spent a lot of time, a lot of research time, Miriam. And, and what's interesting is that I think for a lot of people, I'm in my 50s, and I, I see people around me who are complaining of cognitive challenges. They're seeing subtle and sometimes even more overt decline and wondering what's going on. And I, I think we all have to remember and really take to heart that our brain has, has a phenomenal vulnerability, a positive vulnerability when it comes to nutrition and, and lifestyle and, you know, the gray matter and, and how it is that we, for, for much of history, thought you know, the brain you get is the brain you've got and as we get older it tends to lose its vitality, it can even shrink in size and this, this is true in relationship to certain lifestyles. We know that sugar has a dramatic difficult challenge, if you will, that lays in front of the brain. We've seen studies where sugar can literally shrink the hippocampus, which is our, our center for memory. It's a center for creativity. It's a center for happiness. And the more that we live on refined carbohydrates, the more that we use sugar as a drug of choice, our brain will suffer. And contrary to that, whole foods, foods rich in magnesium, wild fish rich in omega-3s, Turmeric, oh my goodness, we could do a whole show just on <laughs> Indian spices and turmeric and its relationship to help to um, actually help convert DHA and help it turn into... Oh my, oh my we're going to have to get you back because we're, we're getting uh, into areas that I absolutely love to discuss. But we do have to take another break and then we will be right back with Dr. James Rouse. <laughs> are back with Dr. James Rouse talking about think, eat, move, and thrive. And while I am on the subject, what is a website that people can find out more about you? I believe the best website for us would be drjamesrouse.com, D-R-J-A-M-E-S-R-O-U-S-E.com. And I appreciate you asking that, Miriam. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we were talking about the, the various goodies that one can put in your mouth uh, to help your brain, but you also describe the importance of exercise to help your brain as well. Oh, before I get on to that, before I let you answer, I just want to give a shout-out to a, a video that has been on the Internet. <clears throat> it's called um, Sugar the Bitter Truth by Dr. Uh, Robert Lustig. You can find it on YouTube. And if you ever want to be scared out of your wits and scared off of sugar, see that video. 
Anyway, getting back to um, the move part about your book, um, you made a very, very um, compelling case for the importance of exercise, kind of use it or lose it. Um, in particular, you were talking about um, all the excuses that we use not to exercise and how to overcome them. You know, Miriam, you will open a Pandora's box when it comes to exercise. I'm probably the least sympathetic when it comes to the excuses that we make around exercise. And I, and I, and I don't want to sound like a harsh, you know, someone who's just, how should we say, uh, my way or the highway, but th there's just so much good research and, and it's, it's absolutely bulletproof when it comes to how it is that movement from a brain standpoint, from a heart standpoint, immunologically, emotionally, how, how many things can you think of in your life where doing just one thing can affect almost everything that we want more of in our life, whether it's longevity, positivity, um, uh, the opportunity to have zero pain, the opportunity to have ourselves literally be dancing under the influence of non-inflammatory living, to, to have confidence, to have focus, to be motivated. All of those things have a relationship to exercise. And in my practice on the wall in my waiting room, I had a plaque for years that simply said, exercise only on the days that you plan on eating. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, 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 believe, I believe strongly in that statement for many reasons, but just for a couple of things, and this is something you and I, I'm sure, are totally holding heart together, and that is that what we know about exercise is that it's a mindset thing for so many people. We kind of we see exercise as sort of this punitive thing. It's a daunting thing that we put out there on our list of things we should be doing. And I think we have to really challenge that. And that's it's old belief. It's an old limiting thought of how, how we look at exercise. When you really think of all that exercise gives us, I think we have to ask ourselves why it is that we would treat it that way, and how can we upgrade that that thought to say. I get to exercise. I get to feel good. I get to feel energy. I get to feel more positive. I get to feel more confident. I get to feel everything I want to feel more of when I give myself permission to move. And, and all the good research that comes about movement and all motion really creates positive emotion, it comes down to the simple truth. We don't have to work out for an hour or two hours a day. Studies are now showing that cumulative, if you will, just exercising three or four times a day for three or four minutes can deliver all that we want from exercise. If we want to give ourselves just 20 minutes, and it's all about interval-based training, if you just change your speeds when you're walking, that can be a game changer. It can help your body produce something called brain-derived neurotropic factor. And that's sometimes just called BDNF, it's an acronym. And what it basically does, think of giving fertilizer to your gray matter. Think of fertilizing, feeding your brain something that will allow it to grow. Grow in its power, grow in its memory, grow in its brilliance, grow in its conviction. BDNF is released, or if you will, produced when we move. It's produced when we're out there actually stretching ourselves. And it doesn't have to be, again, us knocking out an Ironman or doing a marathon simply taking a 20-minute walk in the morning. And in fact, here's just a little sidebar that I think is really compelling. I was just reading a study out of the, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the JAMA. They were speaking to looking at exercise 150 minutes a week, which really comes down to roughly about 22, roughly 22 minutes a day. And they saw a 260% better opportunity to help your body prevent cognitive decline and help you prevent Alzheimer's disease versus the leading Alzheimer's drug. 260% better outcome by giving yourself the opportunity to move for 22 minutes a day, just 22 minutes. And I think that when you put things into that kind of reflection and say, well, against the drug, or if you will, lined up uh, uh, next to the drug, which one's gonna work better? Only 260% better, just move your body. And oh no my side goodness. effects. 
you avoid the side effects of any of the other. Yeah, and, 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 and the side effects, yes, but then you have all the positive side effects of right. confidence, strength, empowerment, all the things that come with disciplining yourself to give yourself 22 minutes of mindful movement and what it does for your spirit, what it does for your emotional well-being. Yes, all the side effects, no doubt, but all the positive upside that you give yourself, this is where I think you really you look at that and go, my goodness, what a gift, what a blessing it is to move. You mentioned um, high-intensity interval training. Why is that so good for you? Well, what it basically does, and, I, and I'm, I'm not negating the power of a good walk, but I'm telling you, if you're going to go out and walk for 20 minutes, how you can really up-level the benefit of your walking is by doing interval-based training. And whether it's the research command at Harvard, Dr. Rate, who wrote a wonderful book called Spark, and it's all about the power of interval-based exercise, which is simply just changing speeds, walking as fast as you can for a minute or two, slowing down your walk for a minute, and then speeding up for a minute, just going back and forth. It, it does wonderful things to your cardiovascular system. It does wonderful things to your circulation. It does wonderful things to promote growth hormone, to build BDNF. There's just something about the high-intense interval training that takes good exercise and makes it excellent. It takes the great biochemistry and makes it awesome. Hmm. Now, you and your wife um, look annoyingly fit and shirty, <laughs> and you've oh probably gosh, you been that, that way all your life. <laughs> Is this something that you can meaningfully start at any age? Absolutely. Oh, my gosh, Miriam. They're, uh, one of the greatest studies, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, they took a group of uh, gentlemen over the age of 90, 36, 90-year-old men and above, quit and exercise on average at least 35 years, and they put them in a 12-week exercise program of lifting weights. This is, this is just grabbing dumbbells and doing moderate weightlifting over the age of 90. And after 12 weeks, the average lean muscle gain after that 12 weeks of weightlifting, and this was only about 12 to 14 minutes a day, was nearly 330% increase in lean muscle gain. Wow. How about that? Uh, that's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive, and you're 90 plus years old, so yes, there's no limit. There's no one saying that you, at a certain age, can't do it. And let's remember, the most common reason for, how should we say, unfortunate aging or accelerated aging, it's our belief systems. Mm -hmm. Every good study on longevity comes down to ones who look at aging as a, as a rite of passage, as a blessing, as an opportunity to learn and to grow. If we're fighting it, if we're, if we're surrendering at age 60, because we say, well, my, my dad and my mom didn't exercise at age 60, they kind of, they stopped moving when they were 60, your body will follow whatever command you give it. But if you decide that you are going to, how should we say, out-believe your history or your genetic history and decide to actually show up and believe what it is that you want to do each and every day, which is to move, to create, to grow, your body, your cells, your genes will express in kind. And I think that's the wonderful thing to heart. You become what you think about most of the time. I remember that study that put a group of uh, elders into an environment that recreated the 50s for them, and they all started to behave younger and feel younger and feel less pain and were biologically had markers for being younger. It was amazing. Yeah, Ellen Langer, who you're referring to in that study, who wrote the book Counterclockwise. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it just shows you the power of our environment. The and helps. the power of our thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Epigenetics. We How will, we live Oh, no, no, no. I love that subject. We will talk about it as soon as we get back from break. We're speaking with Dr. James Rouse. Think, eat, move, thrive. Universe been trying to get your attention? What will it take for you to start to listen? I'm Miriam Knight and I've interviewed 37 individuals from all walks of life for our book, What Wags the World? Tales of Conscious Awakening. In it they describe the cosmic two-by-fours that changed their lives and their answers may make you rethink your own ideas about the nature of reality. 
is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, or ask for it at your local bookstore. What wags the world? Tales of conscious awakening. You want to be the model 
You want to be the possibility, not for your own well-being only, but more importantly, to have your life example to serve as a catalyst for everyone around you. Loved ones, strangers, your partner, it doesn't matter. That's the most important element when it comes to thriving. To do something for reasons bigger than yourself, you have to define your great big why, and hopefully that why is bigger than you, and then go out there and do your life at that kind of level. That's what Thrive is really all about. I think there was another element that you touched on that is perhaps equally important when you said intrinsic motivation, that you're actually doing things to make your own soul and spirit soar, to feel good about yourself in yourself as opposed to in the eyes of others, to do it for an internal, I need to do this for me kind of motivation. Exactly. I think that for people who are wondering, you know, how do I actually be successful on a diet? How do I be successful with an exercise program? It, it, it has to move from the physical to the spiritual. It, it has to serve us at, at a deep, deep level and understanding how that kind of an experience, that kind of awareness, that kind of a daily practice will help to enliven, help to incite, help to bring into being the fullness of what we can be. That, to me, is, is the perfect demonstration of, of a great life. And if, you know, your focus is cholesterol, your, your focus is inflammation, your focus is serotonin and dopamine, whatever it is, don't be afraid to dig deeper. Don't be afraid to go into the space that really turns you on, that really is what you live for. And that's the intrinsic lever of that deep spiritual understanding of what it is that you came here to do. I love to say it's your job description with a great capital J, the great big job. <laughs> it's not about what you do for a living. It's what you do for your life. And let that be the thing that serves you well. Oh, very, very good. From the doctor's perspective, um, can you give us kind of a roundup of your top tips for our listeners? I would love to give you three things. Um, number one, mindfulness. Mindfulness is critical for every year of your life, whether you're hoping to extend your life, to fight inflammation, to reduce your risk for many diseases out there, but ultimately to help you have more peace and presence in your life. Uh, I guess I'll give you one tip, and that is to learn how to single task again. Try not to multitask. It, there's amazing research that speaks to happiness and its relationship to doing one thing well and being present for that one thing. That's the first thing. Number two, give yourself permission to rewrite your script. And that's the whole idea of epigenetics, yes, Miriam, but it's also the whole idea of having a great big vision for how it is that you want your life to be. You can kind of do an assessment right now, and uh, I believe that every single morning you wake up and you have the opportunity to have a vision. Tibetan monks do a practice called Pemba Tang, and Pemba Tang literally means, in Tibetan Buddhist, um, it means to shoot the arrow, which simply means when you first open your eyes in the morning, see what you want to be. Have that vision crystallized fully have that fully show up, and then move forward into your day. There's a, there's a neurological experience and there's a physiological experience. I believe there's a spiritual experience that happens when we shoot the arrow and see what we want to be. And then lastly, exercise the power of self-compassion, meaning that give yourself permission to be an optimalist. Don't be a perfectionist. Optimism simply means that you are here to be a student of your great life that's always ever becoming. Don't put yourself in a small box of perfectionistic thinking. Be a student, open up to the possibility, and enjoy the journey. You heard the man, enjoy the journey, and think, eat, move, and thrive. Dr. James Rouse, thank you so much for being with us today. It was my blessing, Miriam. Thank you for the honor. And do join us next week when my guest will be Marie Jones talking about Mind Wars. Until then, be good to yourself, do good in the world, and let your light shine.